Good morning, everybody. It is 10.03, so why don't we get started? Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Aaron Fickner, president of the New Jersey Council of County Colleges, and I am very excited to welcome all of you to the third meeting of the Health Services Collaborative. Um, the work that we are all doing together is so critically important. Um, not a day goes by that we don't hear um, from employers or the business community or our friends at NJBIA about the critical workforce shortages and needs, not only today in health services, but in the long term. And the work that all of you have a chance to do together is gonna to position New Jersey to make sure that we are, uh, we have uh, the health workforce that can really ensure um, a uh, robust and healthy state for years and years to come. And importantly, expands economic mobility and opportunities to more New Jerseyans. So thank you all for being part of this important work together. We have a full program today. Um, as you can see from today's agenda, our theme for today's collaborative meeting is experiential learning. And we know in this, in, in this industry sector, in this career area, how important it is for students to have the opportunity to apply what they're learning in the classroom in the field. And so we have an incredible speaker um, talking about um, his perspective on experiential learning and best practices. Dr. Blash, thank you for being with us today. We will then uh, have an opportunity to hear uh, about an innovative partnership between Middlesex College, Bergen Community College and Hackensack Meridian Health and the work that they are doing. And then we will have some breakout sessions to talk about how we all can work together to expand experiential learning opportunities for more students to build that strong workforce for health services. So thank you all for being with us today and, and being involved in this important work. Our centers of workforce innovation and in patient care and healthcare technology and administration have been hard at work developing very aggressive plans for their work, which you will hear about at coming collaborative meetings. And I encourage all of you to stay in touch with us in multiple ways. Um, Proud now to introduce um, Sandra Bleckman, who is the director of health uh, services work uh, for the, the, this initiative. Um, and, and I encourage all of you to stay in close touch with Sandra and Sandra's colleague, um, uh, Stephanie Samuel, who you will meet later. Um, both uh, Stephanie and Sandra are doing incredible work helping to connect people um, working to build this strong ecosystem in health services. So again, thank you all for being with us today. Sandra, good to see you. Good morning. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning. Um, as uh, Aaron mentioned, I am the Director of Health Services Strategy and Workforce Partnerships. And with me behind the scenes is Stephanie Samuel, who is our Program Manager. And we are so happy to have you here today um, for our third Health Services meeting focused on experiential learning. And um, as Aaron went over the agenda, we have a really packed agenda today. Um, and one of the things we added to the agenda is our breakout sessions at the end. So there's a QR code um, that you'll see, and we'll also be sending out a survey. So we'd really like your feedback because this is a new part that we've added. So if you want to scan the code now, you can add that um, and kind of give us your feedback as we go along. And also, if you are tweeting or putting anything on social media, if you could use our hashtag NJ Pathways, we encourage you to share this. Uh, we will be sharing it on social media, but please use our hashtag NJ Pathways. So the first segment of our um, wonderful agenda. We also, uh, we have Dr. Anthony Blash with us. And I think, I just want to tell you a little bit how Anthony got to us, uh, Dr. Blash, because we have had three collaborative meetings and Dana Castro from the Health Information Management System Society uh, from HIMSS has been attending our meetings and she's become very involved. The organization has become very involved in our healthcare tech and admin uh, center of workforce innovation. And as we were talking about experiential learning and talking about how, um, how important it is, she said, Dr. Blash would be a perfect speaker for your next collaborative meeting. And it's just a testament of how this 
ecosystem is working and building and growing each month. So I'm super excited and happy to have Dr. Blash with us. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him um, because we are so happy to have him here. Um, Dr. Blash is an associate professor in the College of Pharmacy at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so he's an hour ahead of us right now, right, uh, Dr. Blash? Um, and he is responsible for crafting the majority of the healthcare informatics concentration of the Doctor of Pharmacy of the College. Uh, Dr. Blash became certified in healthcare informatics through the Healthcare Information Management System Society, which we call HIMSS, in February of 2014. And the Belmont University College of Pharmacy became a HIMSS approved educator um, in 2015. Belmont students who have selected the healthcare informatics concentration and elected to sit for the healthcare informatics certification enjoy a 100% success rate. I think that is an incredible statistic. And um, Dr. Blash came to Belmont from corporate America, which we'll hear a little bit more about his story, um, where he was responsible for pharmacy informatics, healthcare informatics, and clinical decision support initiatives at 20 hospitals and 130 physician and rural health clinics in California, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington. And one thing that I have to add is that Dr. Blanche is a fellow New Jerseyan uh, from Essex County. So I always like to highlight those uh, that come from New Jersey. And so Dr. Blanche, I'm going to turn it over to you. So if you could just tell us a little bit about your, um, you know, your pathway, your career pathway. Thank you for joining us. I think you're on there. You okay, go. there we go. So the mute ministry was winning there. How, how is everybody doing? I hope uh, I hope it's a fun day in New Jersey. I, um, you know, when I was asked to do this, I left at this opportunity, right? So um, there's my exit, right? So you know where I'm from. Uh, everybody uses uh, exit numbers uh, in New Jersey, and I didn't realize that till I left, but that's my exit. Um, I... Um, I graduated from Kane University with a bachelor's in um, management information systems um, back in the early 90s. And um, during that, during that uh, educational experience, I was hired as a programmer at Prudential. So before I got the degree, um, Prudential took a chance on me and helped me with my um, tuition. Uh, they have a great tuition reimbursement plan, and I programmed for Prudential until I graduated, um, and then found an opportunity at Long Island University in Brooklyn uh, to join their pharmacy program. Uh, the bachelor's was the pharmacy degree of the time at that time, but the doctorate for pharmacy, which I, which I got from Creighton, was just coming out. So I jumped into Creighton um, in Omaha, got the PharmD, and now I had you know, a computer science degree and a pharmacy degree. <clears throat> excuse me. And this was just around the time when we were transferring from paper-based records to electronic medical records. So anybody that remembers that, that uh, Lipton or Tetley tea commercial where you're just standing in the pool and you just fall backwards, uh, that was me. Uh, you know, God put me in this place. I, I did not plan this. I just came out with two disparate degrees and, and opportunity caught me. So so I was able to jump into a residency at Creighton. Um, it was the first residency in the nation and I beat out a couple of strong candidates for that, for that position. Um, and that began my healthcare informatics uh, trajectory. So with the, with the doctorate in pharmacy and with this uh, healthcare informatics background, I had the opportunity to bounce back and forth between pure clinical and uh, health information technology, pure clinical health information technology. And that eventually landed me uh, because of those experiences in the corporate setting um, on the West Coast. And I was able to uh, be very successful in that space with that programming background and with that clinical background, uh, because that is a unique combination. And I would say it was a unique combination, but it's, it still is a unique combination. To have those two um, very disparate uh, expertise areas is, is super important for the learning health system that we're trying to evolve today, right? So um, let me make sure I don't miss anything here. Right, so here I am in corporate, I've got you know, 23 active projects on my desk. I was hired 
because of a $2 million project mistake where they, uh, the company tried to uh, run a very large project without healthcare informatics at the table, um, specifically pharmacy informatics. And, you know, it was a very bad outcome. So I'm at corporate, I've got 23 active projects on my desk, everything's fine. You know, there's no problems with the content itself, but just the sheer volume of conversations I'm trying to have was not sustainable. So I reached out, you know, spent a couple of poker chips and got students involved. So for those of you who are not aware, California is the innovation center for healthcare, especially pharmacy. So the first doctorate of pharmacy was in California. Pharmacists as providers came from California. Pharmacy as collaborative practice agreements in California, right? So I'm in California and I'm like, okay, this is gonna be awesome. I can pull students from here. They're gonna be sharp as nails. We're gonna get a lot of these projects done. They're gonna win, I'm gonna win. Uh, we set up collaborative uh, experientials with four of the uh, colleges of pharmacy on the West Coast, right? All from California, all very prestigious. And I'm starting to get students and I'm like, this is gonna be excellent. I literally found out very quickly that I could have, I was on the second floor, I could have walked downstairs, walked out of that front door, saw somebody walking down the street and be like, hey, you, come here. And they would have known as much about healthcare informatics as these students from the top schools in the pharmacy universe, right? So instead of my 23 active projects moving forward, now they're moving backwards, right? Because I'm, I'm literally dragging a student through this journey, starting at the point where I'm pointing up and I'm like, you see that round thing, the yellow that's hurting your eyes, that's called the sun, right? And the stuff you feel at your feet, the green stuff, that's grass. And by the time the month was up, you know, the most that I was able to accomplish was, you know, just getting the student to a basic level of understanding of the conversation. So my projects are marching backwards and I'm like, this is not sustainable. That's when I learned that what the marketplace desired and what academia was providing were not the same. They were not the same, not, not by any stretch of the imagination. And anybody in corporate today, anybody in the marketplace today will tell you that that's probably still the case because it's few and far between that we have those students that are bringing us what we need to, to become effective team members, right? So I decided to leave corporate and come find a space where I could help um, with that information. And, oh, actually I'm on the slide before that. Um, how to fix it. I was comfortable in front of a stage. I was comfortable uh, from my residency teaching courses. I understood, I thought I understood what the marketplace needed from my pain points. So I tried to create students that could help be effective team members, right? I wanted effective team members. So. I go back to academia and I find a space in Belmont University where there is um, where there is a position open for two years in healthcare informatics at the academic level. Um, Belmont University College of Pharmacy was founded in 2009, so very new college, right? We had the opportunity to go to the marketplace because we're in a healthcare hub. Um, Nashville is a healthcare hub. So for those of you who don't know, um, about a mile from here, is the largest hospital owner in the world in Healthcare Corporation of America, HCA, right? So, so we had input from our stakeholders. They wanted to, know, you know, we asked, what, what do you wanna see in a graduating pharmacist, in a graduating professional? And, you know, there were five distinct patterns that came out of that conversation. And one of those was, you know, someone competent in healthcare informatics. And that's how our, we call them concentrations, it's like a minor. That's how our minor of concentration was born in healthcare informatics. So that was in 2009. I joined in 2013. The position had been open for two years before I joined. So there was an opportunity for me to come in with my own voice, with my own direction, with my own ideas, and uh, try to produce that, that person that would have helped me stay in corporate. And it was great, a great opportunity. From that point, 
um, I had HIMSS as my North Star. I was comfortable with the organization. I understood their goals and I understood what they were representing in terms of helping to identify and cultivate uh, competent team members. So the knowledge base that was used was a nationally recognized knowledge base. The ONC was using the same knowledge base um, to formulate their classwork. So it was an easy leap for me to join into the HIMSS conversation. At that point, there was an opportunity to make the student that I wanted to make, right? So, so what does that mean? I think we can go to the next slide now. Essentially, I wanted a team member that could, that could be useful to the team, right? So if anybody who has had students in an experiential manner, for us in pharmacy, it works with one month rotations. So we'll have a student for one month, the student will come in, they'll experience our environment, they'll learn from seeing us and doing things. Um, and that's important to the industry because, you know, eventually you're going to, A, you get to cultivate students to your culture and to your direction. And so they see the importance of what you're doing as an organization. B, you may find superstars that you can recruit directly from this pool of always available talent, right? And that's a plus. It's important to the student, of course, because you know they're just exposed to so many opportunities, so many opportunities. I always tell my my team, my students, you know, when you sit across from a potential opportunity, whether that's a residency, a fellowship, employment, something like that, when you're sitting across from that opportunity, you can confidently speak about your experiences. You can force this person on the other end of that conversation to relate because you've gone through the same challenges, you understand the successes, you scraped your knees, and they're going to recognize immediately that this is a valued team member, potentially. And that separates you from, you know, the rest of the conversations that that opportunity is having with other students, right? So, so becoming that team member is what it's all about. And how's that work? Well, I believe it's through a combination of lecture material, uh, experiential learning, and conversation with a, with a content expert, right? So if, if, I can, if I can help you understand through my experiences, that's one useful part, but that's not it. If I can expose you to the contemporary conversations that we're having in the marketplace from a basic, you know, every, everyone has to start somewhere, right? So starting at the conversational level, uh, vocabulary level, so you speak what I speak and you understand what I understand, that's a plus. If you can stumble along in project work uh, and scrape your knees and come out successful sometimes and fail sometimes, that's important, right? So experiential learning, defined, an engaged learning process whereby students learn by doing and reflect, reflecting on the experience. If you can go to the next slide. And Dr. Blush, I really want to get into the best practices and how we implement that, because we do have a lot of educators on the line that you know may not be as um, informed about health informatics, but also are starting new um, experiential learning programs. And so I really want to you know talk about that too. So thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. So experiential for most people starts at the end. Um, the end of the student journey after all the lectures are done, there's a capstone experience where students get to go out for that one month and be in a place and learn about that place, right? Um, experiential learning in our environment has changed. We started that way, but found out that the students weren't coming in prepared. So we've embedded that experiential into the whole process. So now we have, you know, a depth of team member that can have those conversations and have that experience as they sit down to become a potential team member, right? So if you go to the next slide, please. I think we may have lost the slides. Your, the calendar is up. So again, that depth of team member is important to the process. 
And if you, again, reflect on experiential learning, how it's important, uh, you can see at the bottom EPA, those we call entrustable professional activities. So not only does the student need to know the stuff in terms of lecture, they have to be able to talk with us and understand through the vocabulary and, and have the project work to be able to move forward effectively as a team member, right? So uh, next slide, please. One of the questions that I was asked as I was preparing this conversation, because you know we've never met and I don't know exactly, you know, I have the presentation, but it was important to understand where you were in your journey and what type of questions you would have. So one of the questions was, you know, you have any advice for organizations uh, or, or educational institutions looking to develop or expand on experiential? So again, we in 2009 queried the marketplace. What do you want? What do you want? Right? And once we found that out, we were, we were able to create teams that address that need, right? So when I say query the marketplace, I don't just mean going to a meeting with corporate leaders and asking them their opinion, right? There's another part of that conversation, a much richer part of the conversation um, going on through, uh, through HIMSS, right? So they have a global conference every year where you know, there's 300 or so presentations on cutting edge contemporary conversations that are occurring in healthcare informatics right now. That is going to the marketplace. That is querying the marketplace. So now you have an understanding of, all right, these are the challenges across the entire spectrum of healthcare informatics. Not just the one CEO or the one CIO that you happen to capture, right? So now you understand the encompassing conversation and you can create teams to, to address that need, right? Um, next slide, please. And so, Dr. Blush, if you could just tell us, you know, in a nutshell, what I kind of um, looking at time, we're we're running low on time, so I don't want to um, take away from your presentation. But if you could tell us really these best practices, I love these charts, and I also am going to give all of your slides to all of the um, attendees today, so they can go through it, and we'll uh, wrap up with other questions as well after. So, thank you so much. Yep, no problem. So on this slide, you can see best practices from a lecture component, right? So it can be distance or in person. I have copies of my syllabi that I can share. You can either use specifications grading, um, which some of you may be familiar with, or traditional grading. Does anyone understand or, or uh, are familiar with IRATs and TRATs? So IRAT and TRAT is a way of flipping the classroom back towards the student so they get that experiential component. IRAT stands for Individual Readiness Assessment Test. TRAT stands for Team Readiness Assessment Test. So this is one way to get experiential learning into the lecture components, right? Student assesses on one exam as an IRAT, and then they assess on the same exam as a TRAT. So now the student has to justify their answer to their peers defend their answers, and sometimes they're able to successfully uh, navigate that conversation, sometimes not. But those points gained and lost are actually experience points because you learn to have the conversation. Next slide. In the presentation component, I rarely go to um, the lectures at HIMSS anymore. What I do is I take the content, those titles, and I bring them back to my class and I ask them to create a presentation on those topics. So now the students, the topic, uh, the topic leader, content expert, if you will, right? And then I can fill in the blanks that the student misses with my expertise, with my experience, with my research, right? So now that student is a mini expert in that topic, another experiential opportunity. Right. I think that's wonderful how you can incorporate that from in place of going, you know, to the actual event, having the students become experts. Um, I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, at, to tell us, have there been any roadblocks or challenges as a wrap up to actually developing these um, experiential learning procedures? Yeah, if you bump forward. Yeah, there you go. So any challenges you would occur or incur are probably going to occur in your universe, creating partnerships with uh, the public, with the marketplace, um, advocating for your students' successes, making the marketplace aware 
Um, having the leadership buy-in and support to do that, having the leadership and buy-in support for funding uh, and the culture of your organization is gonna be critical. If they believe in informatics, then that's something that you can make happen. Um, we can open it for questions if you like. We are running tight on questions, but if you do have questions, if you could put them in the chat, actually there are some, and maybe Dr. Blush, if you wanna answer them in the chat, that would be great so we can um, move forward. And we will, um, can we share your contact information if there are questions or can people connect with you on LinkedIn? Just. Um, well, yeah, either way is fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So if you could answer the questions in the chat and thank you so much for joining us. It's, um, you know, it's really exciting to have someone, you know, who's from New Jersey to listen to your career path and move forward. And we're excited for you to hear our next segment about our partnership, um, you know, with one of our partners, Hackensack Meridian Health. And actually we have two students uh, speaking as well. So in moving on to our next segment, uh, I'm really excited and happy to have uh, Matthew DiBartolomeo with us. Matt is the uh, manager of academic relations. And um, we have been working with Matt for a while, I think since we got it started with the collaboratives even before that, and he's been a wonderful partner. And so Matt's gonna talk to us a little bit about some of the experiential learning opportunities for students uh, at Hackensack Meridian Health. And when he's done, we're going to have two of our students, one from Middlesex and one from Bergen um, Community College talking about their experiences. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Matt. All right, thank you so much, Sandra and, and Stephanie for, uh, for organizing today. Uh, as Sandra said, my name is Matthew Bartolomeo. I'm the manager of academic and community relations for Hackensack Meridian Health. And you know, just to give you a bit of, a, of an overview of what Hackensack Meridian Health actually is, uh, we are a leading not-for-profit healthcare organization that's really the one of the largest and most comprehensive and truly integrated healthcare networks in New Jersey, offering a complete range of medical services, innovative research, and life-enhancing care. Uh, currently, Hackensack Meridian comprises of 17 hospitals uh, as far north as, as Bergen County, as far north as, uh, as far south as Ocean County, and they include uh, three, actually now four uh, academic medical centers, two children's hospitals, nine community hospitals, also a behavioral health hospital and carrier clinic, and uh, two rehabilitation hospitals. So we are, you know, all over the state, and, and additional to our hospitals, we also have over 500 uh, patient care locations throughout the state that include, you know, ambulatory care centers, uh, home health services, surgery centers, urgent care centers, uh, health and wellness centers. So, you know, we, we have so many different facilities within, within Hackensack Meridian Health. Uh, we are over 36,000 team members strong and uh, about 7,000 physicians are affiliated with, with our network. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Blesch you know, said before, you know, experiential learning is learning by doing, right? It's really almost hands-on training, being in the, the environment, being, being on the site to, to learn and to train your, your craft, your skill. Uh, at Hackensack Meridian, we like to call it connecting classroom to career uh, in terms of experiential training. And you know, just some of the types that, uh, that we offer that we define as experiential training uh, are first and foremost clinical rotations for current students. Uh, I know that right now I, I listed radiology, respiratory, and pharmacy tech there because I'm working with our uh, allied health recruitment team to really start to bring back those students. So we're, we're doing an audit of all the departments in our locations to see who can start hosting students again, especially after you know, COVID-19. The last couple of years, we really had to, had to minimize the, the student placements a bit. So we, so that's one type of experiential learning that we offer: clinical rotations from, you know, allied health programs, nursing programs, that sort of thing. We also have non-clinical internships. So this summer we are hosting quite a few marketing, IT, and finance interns. Uh, these are actually paid internships as well. So students can simply go on our job site, apply, and go through the regular hiring and, and onboarding process for those types of internships. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I ran a, a summer internship program, uh, and we had about 90 students in there for, for the summer of 2019. So it was a really great program. We look to hopefully bring that back, uh, not this year, but maybe next year. Uh, we're still evaluating that. Uh, in terms of nursing, we have, we have a nurse externship program for rising seniors in, in their nursing programs. And we also have a new program called Earn While You Learn. So this program is for any, uh, any nursing student who have completed their fundamentals of nursing, 
they can apply to this program and, and our part-time or per diem patient care technician or patient observer positions. So that's a really excellent program that we just rolled out this year. Uh, we do have apprenticeships that were built in-house, uh, especially for PCT apprenticeships, uh, pharmacy tech and central sterile processing. Uh, that's another area where if you go to our website, you can see that, uh, that we have those apprenticeships available. Uh, I believe that we also partner with NJ HealthWorks for a phlebotomy tech apprenticeship through our PCT apprenticeship program. So there is that partnership as well. Uh, something new that we're, we're currently evaluating is a structured learning experience. And this really focuses on high schools. So is there a way that we can bring in high school students into our, our facilities and, and uh, really you know, have them get that experience really early on in their, in their lives so they can really be you know, exposed to the healthcare environment and start to learn about different areas within, within the hospital or other healthcare facilities. And in terms of emerging trends, you know, one thing that we're, we're doing this year is uh, through a partnership with Howard University, a one-day job shadowing experience. It's a virtual experience, almost like an intern for a day that, that we're doing. And, uh, and it's something that, that uh, we're really excited about to bring in a few students from Howard University to, to really uh, learn more about Hackensack Meridian Health from uh, an HR perspective, from a DEI perspective, learn about our medical school, and also have some informational interviews with our team members. So that's, uh, that, that's something I'm really excited about that we're gonna do over the summer. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, benefits and advantages, and you know, Dr. Blash, he mentioned this before, some of these, uh, really focusing on the students first, because you know, the, the students are really having a, a, a focus on them and making sure that their experience is as beneficial as possible. Uh, it's, it's really important to us and as I'm sure other organizations too, you know, providing that, that excellent experience. And the first benefit for students is that experiential learning, it really essentially minimizes that, that workplace uncertainty when they apply to jobs, right? So, you know, when, when you're thinking about, um, you know, the, the, the nervousness, the anxiety of applying to a place where you may not know much about that place or the day-to-day -day of, of a role before applying, right? So, experiential learning, whether it's internships or clinical rotations, you kind of get a feel for the atmosphere, right? So that's something that, that's, that's an advantage for students. Also, you, can, you, have, you become more confident and more job ready as a candidate, right? So if, if you're, you're almost essentially ready to hit the ground running from day one, you know, there's still that, that uh, the orientations that you go through and learning about the organizational culture of, of, uh, of the, the employer, but you know, you, you are that, you do have that confidence in place because you know that going through your internship experience, your clinical rotation experience, you know, you did a great job, right? So you, you kind of bring that with you and that confidence shows to the employers. Another benefit is, you know, if, especially if, and I'm really thinking of maybe nursing students here, but I'm sure other areas too, if you, if you do rotations in different organizations or different departments within one organization, you experience different environments. Right, so the communication styles of certain certain leadership based on those locations or or departments, you know, you you, you get a feel and, and you gain more experience through that because you don't work with the same type of person, right? You work with many different types of people, many different types of personalities. So that that's important for a student to to recognize and to to learn about while they're still in school. Also, realistic job expectations, right? You're getting a realistic job preview as a student, you know, what, what, is the, what is the organization like? What's the, you know, the, the, the policies, right? Compliance, that sort of thing. And finally, last but not least, I always encourage any organization or any department who is hosting uh, an intern or an extern to allow them to network and connect with key leadership, right? That, that's important. That's really a best practice, which I'll talk about in the next slide a bit. But, you know, it, it, allows, it allows students to, to learn more, uh, not just their, their, their projects, but also maybe gain some ex advice, career advice from, from executives within the organization. I know that we, we have a, an administrative fellowship program that's rolling out uh, this, this fall. And, and a key component of that is really is to involve key leadership, uh, you know, get, get those fellows in, in executive meetings, right? So they can be exposed to, to that type of environment too. For employers, you know, it's, it's essentially a long-term job interview, right? These, these experiential learning uh, components, whether it's internships or rotations. You know, do you, uh, is this student, are they doing a, a good job? Do you see them 
becoming a, a full-time or part-time team member once they graduate. So it allows for a longer evaluation period for the employer, which, which is a, certainly a great thing. Also, if the student has a great experience within your organization, it creates that, that brand loyalty, that brand affinity with the organization. And you know, that, not, that, that can benefit the student, but also the student can essentially be a referral base for, for other people, you know, telling their friends or their family, hey, this organization is really great to work for. You should apply to certain jobs that, that, that are available there. And last but not least for employers, you know, savings on costs and resources, right? If you know the, the student, if you know the candidate who's applying to a job because they were an intern with you, you know, it, it really creates that, that talent pipeline. And you can save thousands of dollars uh, from, you know, agency costs or other external recruitment costs based on, you know, already having a relationship with some candidates when they eventually apply to, to the positions once they graduate and earn their uh, their appropriate credential. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm sure that there are a lot of best practices that everyone can kind of add to this slide here. But, you know, what, what I've noticed over my experience is first and foremost, any experiential learning experience that, that, that is offered, I always prefer to mimic our, the, the, the regular application interview and hiring process for, for any regular hire. Uh, I think that it provides the student a really good experience to go through that process, just for a professional development standpoint. And, uh, and also it really just, it, it, it creates that consistency in terms of hiring practices within the organization. So that's always a good thing. Second here is a department specific orientation. You know, all organizations have really a, a, a network wide or company wide orientation. Always recommend that, that departments who are hosting a student for, for experiential learning, they have their own orientation where the supervisor or the manager of the department, they introduce the student around to, to other team members. Uh, they, they go over dress code, they get them system access, they do all these things to really make sure that that, that first day that the student is there is a, a really positive experience. So that's important to have that preparation ahead of time before a student even comes in for their experiential learning. I, I love this quote here in the third bullet point, see the forest for the trees. So what, what I mean by that as a best practice is essentially, you know, the student will be working on, on their given project, whatever it might be. But also if there's any opportunity to, to educate the student on more broader processes or how the department and the organization works from, you know, may, maybe a more general sense, I think that's always a good thing. Uh, I, I, I hosted uh, a couple of interns in my experience within, within recruitment. And one thing I always made sure I did is I set up meetings, informational meetings with other areas within HR, such as benefits, um, compensation, employer, employee relations, because I wanted my intern to really get a full 360 understanding of how human, rela uh, human resources works. So I, I think that would be a great, great thing for other departments to do if they, if they have that, that capacity. Last but not least, obviously, assessment and evaluations, both at the midpoint of the experiential learning and also after the experiential learning, whether, you know, again, internship rotation, when that's over, really to, to gain a perspective, not just from the, from the student, but also from the, their supervisor. You know, what can be done better? That's something that we always encourage uh, within our organization. How, we, how can we improve upon our current process or this, this experience? So really gain, gaining both of those insights from, from two different perspectives, the student and the supervisor is really important to us. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, this has been wonderful and I love highlighting this partnership. And now um, <laughs> we're excited to have actually two students speak to us about their experiences at, uh, with you at Hackensack Meridian Health. So um, this has been a wonderful example of a great partnership. So first I'd like to introduce Jay Ree. Um, Jay is a student at Bergen Community College. Hi, Jay. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank, Thank you, you for, for joining us. Me. Thank you for uh, actually sharing this opportunity. Um, so my name is Jay Ree. I'm a senior student in the respiratory care program at Bergen Community College. I'm also an employee at Hackensack Meridian Health, located at the main campus in Hackensack, New Jersey. Uh, I work in the main pharmacy as a pharmacy technician, and I've worked there for five years. Uh, prior to that, I, I was also a IT consultant slash business owner. 
Uh, during those during the years uh, where I worked in main pharmacy, I went into pharmacy technician by studying a textbook on my own and taking the exam. Didn't have any clinical experience. So the experiential learning that, um, that Matthew was uh, discussing, I never got that until I joined the respiratory care program. And I got to see both perspectives. When I did the pharmacy technician uh, studying, I didn't have the experience. And when I got into the work field, it actually was uh, overwhelming, I would say, because you get your textbook knowledge, but you don't get to really uh, perform and try it out until you go into the workforce. And if I had a clinical experience, as I have in respiratory care pro in the respiratory care, care program, I think I would have done a lot more, a lot better, and it would have been a smoother transition, and uh, and got to understand how the workflow is, how uh, who the director, if I fit into the department. Um, with that said, in my two years in this program, I was given the opportunity to attend several clinical sites in a number of hospitals that uh, that we are, uh, I guess, collaborating with, uh, with the school. And I was able to meet the directors, meet different instructors who work in the facility. I was able to meet with the other respiratory care practitioners. And it gave me an opportunity to see if I would actually like working there. I would, and uh, they, you know, they were interviewing me, probably watching me, how I work, how I interact with the patients. And it gave me a great opportunity to see um, what I learned in school and how to implement it with different machines, different technologies that they use. And I think it's a great opportunity if any student gets to go to any of these clinical sites. So you get to really interact instead of just learn through your brain and you know, through reading. Um, the workflow, the, how, the respiratory, how the respiratory departments uh, work with other departments, I think is a great opportunity for students to learn that way. And if, if more hospitals join in, it'll be great. Uh, and you know, it's, to me, I think that's a great experience that you can never do it on your own. So I think uh, one thing that I wish, I wish I had when I was younger is that um, maybe uh, more openings in the high school. And because I didn't, I didn't know about these uh, like other positions except for doctors and nurses in hospitals. It's really not a, talked about field. I only found out through a friend of mine who, uh, who became our respiratory care practitioner. And I learned it through him because he was attending the pro same program. Thank you so much, Jay. I think um, you, you are the true example of what uh, experiential learning means and what it does for someone and giving them the confidence and things of that nature. And we're so happy that you were here to share your experiences with us. So we really thank you for um, coming on and talking to us because we know that um, sometimes it's it's hard to come on and, and take some time away out of your day. So we appreciate you sharing your experiences. And um, if anyone has any questions for Jay, you can put them in the chat, but you're uh, you're an example of why we need to have experiential learning and also why we need to start talking about career exploration earlier um, in, you know, in the high school years. So thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to move over to John Torres, who is a student at Middlesex College. John? Um, if you could share your experiences with Hackensack Meridian, we would, uh, we're so happy to have you here. Good morning. My name is John. Um, everybody calls me Nito. Um, I am uh, actually a phlebotomy student from Middlesex that I had uh, achieved through the PCT apprenticeship program that Hackensack Meridian offers. Um, prior to that, I... Uh, was a fireplace uh, installer and technician for nearly 20 years. Um, better part of my life, basically. Uh, and the apprenticeship program was um, brought to my attention after COVID had hit and you know jobs were just either getting shut down or you worked in the medical field. And as uh, Jay had mentioned, you know, when you go to the hospital or you go to a doctor, you only see doctors and nurses. You don't really know anything else that's going on behind the scenes. Um, so what the apprenticeship program actually offered me um, was a, I call it a crash course. It's nothing like a crash course, but you have two weeks where the first week they teach you 
you know, all the book stuff that you need to know, you know, when it comes to policies and HIPAA and some of the devices that you have to use when you're out on in the field and everything like that. And then the second week, they really um, focus on the skills aspect of it, you know, how to draw blood, how to do manual blood, uh, blood pressures, um, how to work the Dynamaps, you know, patient care, you know, being really involved when it's yourself to the patient. Um, after that, you have approximately six to eight weeks where you're hired by a unit. They bring you in, and I work over at Riverview Medical Center, and my unit is complex care. And I couldn't have asked for a better team to get brought into, especially being new in the medical field um, and going from something that was totally like day and night, you know, yeah, customer service is one thing, but patient care is a totally different thing to get brought into. So with absolute zero um, medical knowledge and experience in the field, by the time I stepped onto the floor for the first day, that apprenticeship program, that first two weeks gave me that little bit of an edge that, hey, I can do this. And then by the time I got done with the eight weeks of um, being on the floor, having my preceptor teaching me the ropes and, you know, doing it myself, the confidence level that I achieved when I got out of the eight week orientation was unimaginable. And the one thing that I can attest for it is I'm a firm believer in the see, do, teach theory. Um, you know, you see it get done, then you do it with, you know, somebody helping you out. And then by the time you're done doing it, you're able to teach what you know. You have that confidence to go in there and teach everything. And Middlesex, with this apprenticeship program, Middlesex really um, helped out because they did do that partnership where um, they have the phlebotomy course. And that was an eight week long course. The instructors over there, Annie Pratt's, she's amazing. I was in constant contact with her because again, right out of high school, I went right into the fireplace industry. So it had been almost 20 years since I did any type of schoolwork. <laughs> so she was very helpful and with the programs, I was able to get my national certification as a phlebotomist. And now I'm able to go out on the floor. And if somebody needs help with a blood draw, I have that confidence. I have that. I know how to do this. I know here, let's do it this way. So it, it's very beneficial. I couldn't have even imagined uh, being in the position that I am today. Um, I'm coming up on one year with Riverview. And it's been amazing. It's been a journey. It, it's great to, you know, really grasp a new career. And again, I couldn't have imagined it being any better. Thank you so much. That Hearing your story is just amazing, right? And I think it, again, that resounding thing that we keep hearing is about confidence, right? That experiential learning builds confidence and it helps build, especially in the healthcare industry, right? When you're first posed with a patient or you need to do something. So I, I thank you so much for coming here and joining us and telling your story. And there's been a lot of uh, chatter in the chat box. So we will make sure that Matt and Dr. Blash receive all the questions, but they'll also be in breakout rooms. Um, we're going to quickly move to a breakout room, but I wanna thank all of our speakers. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Blash. Um, thank you, Matt, for uh, and our students, Jay and John. This has been amazing. Like, I wish we could stay on all day. I know everyone has time constraints. So we're going to quickly move into our breakout rooms. And so uh, it's just an opportunity to talk a little bit more about experiential learning and network. So uh, you will be prompted now to join a breakout room. And once you join, uh, start the conversation. Thank you so much uh, again for joining us. And um, we, I can't say enough about today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Amory McNamara, I'm the Supervisor of Career and Technical Education at Union County Vocational Technical Schools. So I deal with high school age. So, uh, you know, and obviously CTE is all about hands-on and experiential learning. Absolutely. 
Thank you. Thank you for, for being here this morning. Uh, Mitra. Hi, good morning. I'm Mitra Chaudhry with Essex County College, and uh, we deal with the uh, vocational training programs at Essex County College. Thank you. Thank you, Mitra. Uh, Judy. Morning, everybody. Judy Savage. I'm a senior consultant for the New Jersey Council of County Vocational Technical Schools. Outstanding. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Jeff. Hello, I'm Jeff Bonfield, Director of Assessment at Rowan University. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, teeny or tiny? <laughs> teeny. teeny, okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tinny Chung. I am from Union County College. I'm the Assistant Dean of Student Success. Thank you. Uh, Belinda? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Chief Human Resources Officer at New Jersey Hospital Association, but I started in the business a long time ago as a recruiter. So uh, I, I have worked with all of your schools at one point in time or another because I was at Broadway Hospital for a very long time. And prior to that, I was at what used to be called Middlesex General Hospital, which is now Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. So um, I've, I've been in HR my entire career for, for um, recruiting and trying to work on workforce pipeline. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and listening into some of the experiences and trying to help you. Outstanding, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, my colleague, Stephanie. Good morning, Stephanie Samuel, Program Manager with Health Services and with Infrastructure and Energy. Thank you all for being here. Carolyn. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carolyn Ross. I'm Director of Talent Development at Valley Health System. Thank you. Uh, Joanne. Yes, good morning. Joanne Kleindens, Vice President of Professional Development with HIMSS. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I hail from the great state of Pennsylvania in Bucks County, and my son-in-law, Andrew Morris, is a graduate of Sussex County Community College. So this is both thank personal and professional for me. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, my colleague, Joe. Yes, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Joe Prancitelli, and I'm... Uh, the project manager for our GAINS apprenticeship program. GAINS stands for uh, Growing Apprentices in Non-Traditional Areas, such as Manufacturing, Advanced Manufacturing. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Joe. Uh, D. I'm Darylene DiNardo. I am the Assistant Director of Continuing Education and Workforce Development at the State County Community College. Nice Thank you. Here. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Jesse? Hey, uh, Jesse Liss, uh, faculty of Rutgers. Thank you for being here. Peter? Uh, good morning, everybody. Peter Radigan. I'm the Dean of the School of Nurse, uh, actually now the Virtual Health School of Nursing and Health Professions at, at Rowan University. Uh, and I come with an apology. I had this on my calendar on my calendar for an hour later than it actually is. So I, I thought I was jumping in nice and early, and I missed the whole first part. But I did get to hear the student, which is very important. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit behind, probably mostly listening, uh, but but happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. And and the sessions is will be recorded, so it will be provided uh, uh, later. Thank you for being here. And lastly, Elizabeth. Hi, good morning. My name is Elizabeth Moore. I work for Rutgers University, the Division of Continuing Studies, and we cater to working adults. So we do the third and fourth years of uh, college for bachelor's degrees for students that have associate's degrees that are looking to move forward. Outstanding. Outstanding. So thank you all for, for, for joining us today. And I guess we'll start off by, I saw some questions in the chat. Were there, were there questions or does anyone have examples of experiential learning um, experiences that either your educational uh, institution is, is currently involved in, some best practice you would like to share with the group, or are there other questions that you'd like to explore uh, amongst our group here today? So 
So Glenn, I'll just jump in and say that, you know, you know, we work with RWJ. So, um, uh, you know, what we are doing is um, healthcare profession. So mostly CNA advanced, which is patient care tech and CNAs. And um, the way we use experiential learning for them is, you know, it's all, all health programs that, you know, are clinical based. So um, they do their clinical experiences while they, after they finish um, their um, classroom um, experiences. And the, for patient care tech or CNA advanced, they do the phlebotomy and EKGs built into the curriculum where they do lab work um, you know, for phlebotomy and EKG. And then the model that um, RWJ is using right now is they're actually hiring the employees. And after they're hired, they're sending them for training. So they're taking three, four, or sometimes five to six weeks, um, you know, to send them to us to do the training. And then they're going back to their site after they have been trained. So there are some of these employees are, uh, uh, you know, they're already in the system, they're being upskilled, and some of them are, they have been hired. So there's these two models that being yes. followed for RWJ. Thank you. That's, that's a welcome. wonderful, wonderful example. Jesse, you had your, your head hand raised. Um, yeah, I'm faculty in social sciences, and I just, this past semester started an uh, internship program, public health related internship program, specifically with a group called Believe in a Healthy Newark, as well as you know many of their partners, uh, Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition, et cetera, et cetera, a bunch of partners. But ours is grant funded, which is not sustainable and also not scalable. Very interested in finding scalable solutions to experiential learning. And when we started this, uh, my partner and I were talking about how do we how do we expand this also to private sector and to industry, uh, which has been challenging in that, you know, do you start at looking at the occupational level or industry level? Um, I'm also in social sciences, so we're looking specifically at non-medical life science industries, which are massive in New Jersey. Uh, and I'm very interested in partnering with uh, the community colleges in terms of, you know, what kind of curricular integrations can we develop at the four-year level? And I'm super interested and very excited uh, by what's going on in Pathways that the merging of industry credentials with academic credit with academic credit that to me is very exciting and i look forward to seeing how these conversations develop and how uh, we can be involved as well thank you jesse and and thank you for for giving us uh, um some of your challenges you, you 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 touched on a challenge that dr blash mentioned about funding and so that sustainability piece judy i see Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so from the perspective of New Jersey's county vocational technical schools, primarily at the secondary level, um, experiential learning is really what it's all about. And um, it definitely has been challenging, particularly during the past two years with COVID in the healthcare setting. Um, you know, understandably hospitals and even um, nursing homes, which provide a lot of clinical training sites for students like in um, nurse assistant programs have been reluctant to have students under age 18 coming on site. So we have some work to do with building that back. And I think there's just, I, it seems like there is growing recognition within the healthcare sector that um, hospitals and other providers need to offer experiential learning for, and Matt um, did a really good job of laying out the benefits, not just to the students, but to the employers of doing that. But it's very, very labor intensive, um, particularly at this high school level where the healthcare teachers are responsible for the class and helping to find students with placements and you know making sure that they're well placed and and safe so you know certainly anything that we can do as a collective group to make the workplace more hospitable and open to providing these kinds of experiences and to recognizing that it's not just college students, but also high school students who need to start getting some real world experience in the healthcare setting is to the benefit of everyone. 
agree. Thank you, uh, Judy. Um, that falls into that that category of what are some of the roadblocks um, to experiential learning that that many of our our educational uh, organizations are, are facing. And, and you're exactly right that on, on the high school level that um, has always been a struggle, especially for those uh, uh, vocational and technical programs that really have a requirement to be be engaged with this, these experiential opportunities. Um, I saw another hand I don't know, in this last minute. Uh, D, I'm sorry. Yes, D. Um, so at uh, Passaic County Community College, I get to run a lot of our allied health courses, which is great. Some of them, um, phlebotomy and EKG, we do everything in-house where they can do their, get their sticks, get their um, EKG scans, the requirements that they need in order to get a job out in the industry. <clears throat> but what's really cool is that I also work with our radiography department and we get them in there. Um, so it's really nice to be able to have that where they can go in and get their um, rounds or get their uh, exper experiential learning, which is really nice. The students appreciate that instead of just having to learn um, from the book and never doing it. I come from a background where I was very much just give me, give me it to do so that I can learn it. You know, you can give me all the book work that you want. I can learn that in the book work, but it's never going to be the same as when you give it to me to actually do and to learn more. So I am a big proponent of that. Thank you. That, that's, that's an excellent example. Um, we're, we're right up against time. And I wanted to just to, to, to say to everyone, thank you again for joining us uh, for this collaborative uh, uh, session today. A, a lot of great information was uh, shared by both our presenters, but more importantly, by our students who are actually the recipients of the work that everyone here does. Um, and their real world examples really crystallize uh, the types of, of, of uh, needed you know, efforts that we on, on the part of all of our collective uh, body to, to, to further expand and support uh, the, next, the next generation of, of learners that are coming into this space. It, that's gonna be important to really strengthen the industry as a whole. Um, and as you could tell, from listening to both Jay and to uh, John, um, everyone's everyone's journey and everyone's pathway is a little different, and I think that was that was and and even listening to to Dr. Bash and his experience um, uh, that was illuminating. So thank you again uh, for for joining us. We encourage you to give us uh, you know your feedback uh, about uh, the session today. Um, if you have not had a chance to to do the survey, uh, you see the uh, the um, Q code on the screen. You can scan it to your phone if you like, and you could uh, fill out the survey. We we really would like your uh, your feedback regarding that. Um, our next our next uh, health services uh, collaborative meeting um, in May will be the uh, the third week. Uh, I'm not sure what that exact date is, but you'll be you'll be receiving a announcement about that uh, probably in the next week or so about uh, the, the, uh, the next uh, session. Uh, but, but I encourage you to, to reach out to either Sandra or Stephanie uh, regarding any of the information today. We would, th this uh, session has been recorded, so it will, it will be provided for those who are not able to uh, attend uh, today. Uh, but in addition to that, some of you were wanted to connect with some of our speakers. If you don't, if you're not connected with them directly, um, Stephanie, who's here, um, as well as Sandra, are more than glad to to connect you um, to help further further this initiative. But again, thank you for for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day, and hope to see you soon. This industry, so. We, we have to think of ways, innovative ways to either, you know, whether it's through tuition assistance, if it's through creating new programming ourselves, like the Earn While You Learn program that I mentioned Love for nursing program. students <laughs> and otherwise, yeah. Um, 
And so here we are in our breakout room. We have, you know, 14 participants. I, I kind of would love, uh, you know, if anyone wants to talk about after, and we're thankful to have both. I'm so honored that I have both of our speakers in my breakout room. I don't know how that happened, but it was luck of the draw. Um, but if anyone has any reactions or reflections to either Matt or Dr. Blash's um, and wants to talk about some best practices or, you know, any experiences they have in their own experiential learning programs, that would be great. I think that's a nice way to kind of gear the conversation and then you know we can you know go from there so when you just speak if you could just say your name and your you know where you're from so we know who's speaking that would be great if anyone wants to start roberta <laughs> I, I will um i was i was in the chat i've uh, talked with with matt before as well uh, I just wrote down um, the workplace is not going to wait and um, academic institutions need to step into the gap. Uh, that's exactly where we are. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're doing some of those things. We have um, phlebotomy as a way for students to get clinical experience. Um, we are, as, as Matt knows, we're, we're starting a respiratory therapy program, a four year, and actively pondering, <laughs> grappling with. Uh, how you get, even, even with a four-year curriculum, how you add, you know, how are we going to add experiential learning early in the curriculum? How do we fit it in? And how do we make that an effective recruitment strategy? Because this is, this is part of what's going to happen, you know, is, is um, you know, trying to find the qualified and, and passionate um, applicants. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm just here to listen and learn. It's just fantastic. Sandra, you're right. This is a, I couldn't, I couldn't take notes fast enough. And I, and I kept thinking, who's not here that I should have invited, <laughs> but I got to carry the message back. So thank you. Thank you both for um, really amazing, valuable presentations today. Thank you. I think we'll have to have experiential part two, right? Um, since this discussion has been so great. So does anyone else have an, a best practice they want to share uh, with us? Or any reflections on, you know, Matt or Dr. Blash's uh, presentations. Just a reflection, Sandra. This is Joe from Ocean County College, Joe Canopla. Um, I think sometimes we try to overthink the experience that we want to give to students. And I think we talked about it today. It could be as simple as shadowing someone for a day. Um, it doesn't have to be a full-blown um, apprenticeship approved program. And that's the part that we're trying to figure out more here at Ocean. How do we get those experiences? And Matt, we invited you up to an, uh, an upcoming uh, health advisory meeting that we have here to talk through that, just that topic. Um, but uh, it's such a broad spectrum of opportunities we could give to our students early on so they really know what they're getting themselves into um, in the healthcare space in so many different roles. And it's not just the patient care space, I think we have a lot to do in um, other outlining areas, including public health, um, community health work, or that type of awareness, you know, position that maybe doesn't exist yet that we need to get to. But this is this has been a great conversation today. Thanks, Sandra, for organizing this. Thank you. And I think in, in, as far as health informatics, that's a new ground that a lot of our schools have not really... Um, been involved in. And so we're so excited to have Dr. Blash and also, you know, HIMS working with us in the in the Center of Workforce Innovation because um, both students said they didn't know about these careers, right? And they weren't aware of them. And that's part of that experiential learning, right? Going one day uh, that, you know, uh, we were talking about zooming in for a day to be an intern for a day or one of those things that is so important. Um, does anyone else have any, you know, we had two great success stories. I love the students today um, that were able to join us. Does anyone else have any success stories they want to share or anything else relating to experiential learning, any roadblocks they've had in creating experiential learning? I know that, you know, in the high school level, it becomes difficult with, uh, you know, age or transportation, but are there any other types of roadblocks uh, or success stories? Because I like success stories that anyone wants to share. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I have a success story for an intern that I had, and she received an offer. So she was an intern with me when she was a junior going into senior year uh, that summer, and she received an offer from a financial services organization. So not even Hackensack Meridian, but she was based on her internship and based on her, the, the projects that she worked on, 
she received an offer in her first semester of senior year upon graduation that she would be, so she already had a job lined up for her right away. Uh, so that, that just like removes so much stress for, for the student. I remember when I was a senior in college and, you know, just thinking about, you know, what am I going to do after this? So, I, it, you know, th those things are, are really important, you know, those, those internship experiences. And, you know, I, I think that that's a, a great thing for, for students to, to go through that, that feeling that she had was really, uh, you know, awesome. I agree. And I think it gives you the not only learning what you do like, but learning what you don't like, right? We talk about that a lot because students sometimes go into, uh, you know, into programs and they're not 100% sure about what it entails, right? The daily duties or what it, you know, what it actually means. Um, and like Dr. Blesh, who fell in backwards into the pool, right into his career path, I think most of us could say that, you know, we, when I was 18, if someone told me that I would be working for the Council of County Colleges, working on career path, I didn't even know what a career pathway was, you know, it wasn't. So I think, you know, as we move forward with these pathways initiatives and bringing everyone together in this ecosystem, it's really helpful because it spreads the word of what's available and who's doing what. And I think it helps us to, to spark new ideas. Um, I know we're coming up on 11 and I know I always am conscious of people's times. I saw someone had to drop. Did, Dr. Bless, do you have any final words or remarks or, um, you know, based on after your presentation, what you saw with Matt and the students or anything else that you'd like to share with us before we uh, close? I always want to start with the end in mind, right? Try to figure out what the marketplace is needing. What are our pain points? If you can identify that and create a resource to fill that gap, there's no way you're not going to be successful. If you, if you position the student with receipts that can show that they can help uh, with that pain point, you'll, you'll never have to worry about uh, a position in life. I think that's a great, you know, when you think about it in terms of the receipts, right? I love that. That's wonderful. Uh, Matt, any final closing, you know, uh, remarks or anything that you'd like to share? I, I, I think, you know, exposing the students to, to other opportunities in healthcare besides, you know, doctors or nurses is, is really important. And just how, how can we, how can we partner? How can we be you know, maybe more creative in offering new programming to the students. You know, I, I think that's that's important. But you know, keeping in mind with, with what Dr. Blash said, thinking about the end, the end result first, right? Thinking what what are those pain points, and starting from there, essentially. So I, I certainly agree with what you were saying. And, and I do want to thank you all for joining us. Um, our next health services collaborative. We've started on a Monday schedule. Um, will be um, May eighteenth. So I just want to let you know, you'll all receive an invitation with, it has all of our sectors. Um, someone asked me the other day, can I go to the other sectors to listen? And I said, of course, you can, you can go to any of them that you'd like. And um, I think that as we move forward with this collaborative, as I said, it's great to just, it just keeps growing, right? Um, you know, including hymns with us and Dr. Blash. And so it, it's been a true testament to what we can do together um, when we're not working in a silo. And so also all of the information today, uh, the, the presentations I will, will be sent out, uh, they'll be posted on our website with a video. So you'll be able to see that. And you know, if anyone has any closing or any final thoughts, uh, thanks, Dr. Blash. Uh, please let us know. And if not, uh, we'll see you on May 18th for the Health Services Collaborative. And if you know, if you ever need, I'll put my contact information also. If you don't have it, if you uh, have any questions or um, you know want to connect or speak about any of the initiatives, uh, I'm happy to connect with you as well. So thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks thank for you. organizing. Thanks again, Dr. Blash and Matt. Thanks. My pleasure. Nice returned. to meet you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. So please welcome everyone. I'm Stephanie Staub. I'm a director of the infrastructure and energy sector here to kind of moderate our breakout session, but I'm looking forward um, to hearing from all of you. And so we do pose these questions. Feel free to give us some feedback. Um, does your organization have an experiential learning best practice that you'd like to share with the group? Have there been any roadblocks that you've encountered in implementing experiential learning that maybe you can share those experiences so others can avoid or understand what may come in the future as they try to implement um, an experiential learning program? Or do you have an experiential learning success story, some positive outcomes that you would like to share with us? So 
I look forward to hearing from, from any of you. Who would like to go first? Faith, you're, you're on video, so I'm going to see, do you have, do you have any experience or, oh, I'm trying to ask you to unmute. There we go. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, wait, ask to unmute. There you go. Yes. Okay, perfect. What would okay. you like to share with the group this morning? Um, so I'm Faith Callard. I work for New Jersey Health Works Scaling Apprenticeship Grant, and I was just so happy to hear John Torres speaking this morning. Oh, that's terrific. He was great. I was, I called our director up. I'm like, oh my God, listen to this. Um, we, we are the uh, group that work with Hackensack to uh, set up the phlebotomy uh, apprenticeship program. Oh, terrific. So, um, you know, um, I just want to get this out there. You said, uh, that's a best practice for us. I think that is a scalable best practice, what we have done. We're, we're working on a lot of, um, part of the apprenticeship has the OJL, the 2000 hours or one mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So I always explain it since it's the new model to employers. It's similar to an, um, to, um, an internship, an externship, and um, you know something you're doing within your program, but it's just a different wording and just a, a slightly different parameters that are needed sure. for it. Right. Absolutely. So don't get scared. Don't get away. That we we change words up and we change what the model looks just slightly, but mm -hmm. the the idea of it is always the same. So what have been some of the roadblocks? Well, number one was COVID, and we're we're a healthcare grant and staffing. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of our problems have been not only they, the uh, systems don't have enough staff to host and be mentors or work with potential apprentice, apprentices. Mm -hmm. It's just really a staffing issue for us. Okay. Um, things have opened up because we've kept engaged. Another thing is, um, you know, when we started working with Hackensack, it took us a year and a half to launch the first one. So it is a time consuming, not only... To you have to listen to the employer and find out what the needs are, what they're looking for. And, you know, once you keep moving forward and get through the weeds and you launch that first one, you come back together. We, we speak every week. Mm -hmm. We're very engaged with our employers. We our, our teachers on there, everybody, the whole team's on there. And now it's like we're done in 10 minutes. Wow, that's great. That's great. Here. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I, and I think that you guys could be a terrific resource for those who are looking to implement something like this. So we yep. appreciate that all the information that, that you're willing to share and our, our Bergen Community College partners are, have been terrific in this initiative and, and doing just that, being examples um, and sharing information. So, so thank you. I want to try to get to um, someone else. So is there anyone else on that would like to maybe share um, an experience that you have, your best practice, or a a particular obstacle that you've encountered. I know Maria, I think I saw you put a nice comment on the, on the, in the main room about, um, oh gosh, I think it was maybe in, in, in um, to Dr. Blatt's um, presentation. So anyone else willing to, to share with us this morning? We have just a few minutes, so please don't be shy. Oh, okay, Kathy, I'm going to, here you go. Are, Perfect. Nice uh, to meet you. Nice and to who, meet you. Uh, I'm Kathy Skelly from Essex County College Training, Inc. So I'm wearing a couple hats today. We are the lead for the actual um, healthcare tech and administration administrative uh, collaborative. So we're excited for that. And also I work with Faith as well on the NJ uh, HealthWorks Apprenticeship. But um, just speaking, uh, just bringing up a point that I think all the, the uh, guest speakers have, have spoke to is that engaging with employers from the beginning and finding out what are their needs so that academia is matching mm -hmm. the needs of the marketplace and the employer. And so even as they're doing a clinical or as the student is going through um, an externship uh, to, to get the feedback from the employer. So in the beginning, we were hearing a lot, you know, please do more professional development, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of students, you know, you're getting all the head knowledge, but dealing with people or, um, you know, the, the piece of communication, you know, and all right. these things, or an HR 
uh, take on it. So whatever, that's just one example. So I think engaging with the employer from the beginning when you're developing your curriculum, as you're going through your curriculum, and as you're implementing it at the end um, is because we want the student to succeed and we want the employer to be happy and we want to see, you know, a great partnership for future collaboration. So that would be one of the things that I would just speak to. Perfect. Yes. And, and, and that's so true. Like those internships, that's really that, that, that connection between the curriculum and, and the employer, right? And so you want to make sure that you're, you're teaching what they need to know, that they're able to implement it and they're demonstrating that throughout the the internship and then the employer is getting exactly what they need and and there's that constant flow of information back and forth so that's a terrific terrific point to make um critch i'm gonna hope i'm pronouncing your night your name right Krichika, would you like to um i'm not familiar there you go. let me ask you to unmute sure here we go sure, just give me a second i'll get my video going as well just give me a second okay excellent thank welcome you. thank you um, yes, uh, I'm from North America. Um, most I have to fess up that um, what ha things have been really challenging because our target population is youth 16 to 21 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have observed is there's a lot of interest um, in the schools to pers to help the youth get a head start in a career in healthcare. Okay, however, there are insurance restrictions, right? Um, places want to hire only when they are 18 plus. So then how do you bridge the gap there? So that's that's something we, we're constantly looking into. You know, As you know, in apprenticeships, there's uh, classroom instructions followed by on-the-job training. So what we're trying to do is try and see if these kids can complete the classroom portion of the training so that by the time they're 18, they can gear up for the on-the-job training. You know, again, it's I'll, yes. I'll confess to it being pulling tooth and nails, but it's really refreshing to find people here who have had good success. So our goal is to continue having this conversation, connecting the different stakeholders so that these kids who are really vested in starting a career in healthcare can benefit from all these coalitions. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, that's exactly what we're doing, you know, talking to schools, talking to employers, talking to community colleges to see how best to align everyone's interests so that we can create a program, a pathway for these students to get started and kind of build their um, way up in uh, with a career in healthcare. So that, that's where I would And that is a really good point. And I think that was a comment that was made in the main room about the the 18 years old in order to be on certain you know in employers or on you know out out in the in the workforce. So that is a challenge, and that is a great way of kind of overcoming that, focusing on the education first until they. They reach that but i'm glad that you're here and part of this collaborative and i think this is a great place for you to make those connections and if there are any um, introductions or, or connections that you're looking to make within the collaborative please always reach out sandra stephanie samuel all of our contact information is on our website so um, thank you for being here and, and sharing that so being very cognizant of everyone's schedules we are right at 1101 i just want to quickly go through and remind everyone of a few housekeeping items. So again, just wanna thank you all for your time this morning and your input and be willing to share some stories with us in the breakout. We're always looking for feedback on how we can improve um, these collaborative meetings, whether it's a logistical, um, whether you like the breakout rooms or looking for something different, specific topics of interest, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you to, that, uh, to a feedback questionnaire. The link will also be sent in a follow-up um, email to all participants. Um, again, if you're if you're new to the to the collaborative, um, here is our website. You can also scan that to go right to the website, fill out that get involved form to become an official partner of the collaborative. We're always posting updates and information on our social media channel. So please do connect with us. We would love to see more interaction, you know, on there and maybe some sharing of stories and best practices on those social media cha uh, channels. And then finally, just letting you know the dates for the upcoming collaborative. So again, I mentioned I'm the director of infrastructure and energy. Our collaborative takes place on the last Wednesday of the month, so that'll be next Wednesday at 10, and then we start the cycle over in May, manufacturing and supply chain on May 4, technology and innovation on May 11, and then your healthcare services, you all will be back again on Wednesday, May 18th. 
So that is it for today. Again, thank you all very much for your time um, and attention and willingness to share this morning. And we look forward to seeing you again next month or hopefully next week if you're also interested in infrastructure and energy. Have a terrific day, everybody. Thank you. Great, so uh, open up the floor now. Hi, Nancy. Hi, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Nancy Hiller with the New Jersey Department of Labor in the Office of Research and Information. Nice to meet everybody today. Great. And, and Frank and Joanna and Susan, and Susan and I, we were, I think we were in a breakout session before, and DeZales, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but I was trying. Um, yes. Okay, and Helen, so Stephanie and Jen, so does anyone really want to talk about what your organization may do as it relates to uh, experiential learning, either from your perspective? Probably Frank? More. Sure. Uh, Frank Creston from ACI Medical and Dental School. Uh, we've been operational for 16 years, and we specialize in the medical assistant uh, dental assistant and the medical and dental administrator, the operational part of both medical and dental. Uh, all three of our programs has uh, extensive internships. Uh, Matt from um, uh, Hackensack uh, has uh, worked with our programs um, for an extremely long time. And Hackensack actually sits on our advisory board because we're accredited by middle states colleges and schools. We're the oldest accrediting agency out there. Uh, we, we have an advisory board. So Hackensack, Center State, Mama Cardiology, and probably a, a, a half a dozen other medical and dental practices, professional stakeholders um, sit on our advisory board. And we have an internship for all our programs, both day and evening, um, with, with medical practices and dental practices as a requirement of their program. So uh, uh, we, we and in, in, in the school itself, an accelerated program, within four months, uh, we have the didactic and then we do clinical. So it's hand, teaching and hands-on, teaching and hands-on, which really optimizes the learning process um, for us. Right. Thank you so much for that, Frank. So basically um, what you're really saying is they do go hand in hand and that part of the teaching, quite frankly, is an experiential learning experience, a, a clinical. And both, you know, it was just really great to hear both of the students who participated in that program talk about how it really does ease them into the workplace because they have that experience. And quite frankly, it's a confidence builder for the, uh, particularly for the student as they're moving into that space. Does anyone else want to share um, experiential learning best practices from their organization? Uh, so I just want to add to that, that not, not only does it, it validates your experience um, and your confidence on the site, but it also builds your resume, uh, the internship component. That's their first uh, entry in the, in the medical and dental field for many of our graduates. Um, so that, that experience, again, confidence and validation of what they know and that they, they, they do have the knowledge that's necessary to be successful out there, uh, but it also uh, increases their exposure to building their resume. Absolutely, I think that's a great point, Frank. Joanna, did you wanna say something? Uh, good morning. Good um, morning. Joanna from Essex County College. Um, and we have um, internships and clinicals in all of our uh, allied health programs, uh, the PCT, the CCM, the, all of those that are required clearly, as well as our nursing, um, what we're interested in doing because we're, I, I'm, we're actually, Essex is part of the, the collaborative that's, we're one of the institutions right, looking the at, the, Absolutely. Right, at the cluster. So we're trying to um, create these experiential learnings for non-clinical, Program. So uh, I was excited um, to hear some of the ideas Matthew put out and, you know, some of uh, Dr. Blash's uh, um, in-classroom um, potential for, for infusing and embedding them into what we already control. So um, I thought that was really great today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. Does anyone else want to talk about that? Or we can also talk about an experiential learning, maybe some of your positive outcomes. I know Frank shared some of their positive outcomes because of the students that are involved in the work that they've done. Um, does anyone else, would anyone else like to talk about an experiential learning success story? Susan? 
Yeah, um, you know, as you know, that these are are part of all of the credit bearing clinicals, and they're becoming a strong part of the non credits as well. And so they're really like a one to two year job interview. You know, Jay had shared that he had been through multiple systems, and that's really important for us to do, to be able to um, have those clinical partners and clinical affiliates so that students do get a chance to um, see different delivery systems and where they might fit. Uh, to um, the previous speaker, the co-op is really on the rise again and outside of, of health professions. So I know that we're working with our um, workforce readiness and, and workforce preparedness in um, more emerging co-ops where you are going out as consultant, as students are going out as consultants. And uh, we have a program right now working with the county and the student uh, consultants, and they are going out in economic recovery for many of the businesses to teach a lot about technologies, to teach a lot about social media, to teach a lot about engagement. And so um, that's a really important part, again, outside of healthcare. This has been standard and fundamental to health career programs by accreditation and, and by requirements for licensure. So right. in order to complete the program, and so I was just looking this morning that I knew that Jay was talking, and so they go through 1,104 clinical hours, externship hours in the respiratory care program. So they get a lot of experience in multiple areas. And so that is that was for respiratory care because Jay was speaking, but you're going to see that in your nursing programs, you're going to see that in, in all of the programs. But one of the things that's also happening is to be able to enhance the collaborative efforts and the interdisciplinary efforts and engaging students in those processes to be able to recognize fundamentally that they are in their own specialties, but it really takes a village or it takes a team to have successful patient outcomes. So that's going to be just as important in moving forward. And we found that a lot of those successes come from those types of initiatives. Right. Thank you so much for that, because Susan, what you really hit on is one of the things that we heard from our national speaker talking about that kind of partnership between the employer and the educator as it relates to the monitoring, the structuring, the feedback in both places in the field, but also uh, when they are in the classroom and integrating that process. Um, Stephanie, did you want to, I, I saw that you had um, opened your mic. Did you want to share something with us? Yes, I, I'm from Texas County College and I'm in the Office of Student Development and Counseling and I'm the Director of Student Development and Career Services. And I wanted to add that yes, in addition to the formal regulated uh, clinical experiences that our health academic programs have, we also have in our social sciences formal internships on our, and or field work for our students who are in the human and social services major, the paralegal studies major, and the education major. Mm -hmm. And our co-op is run by the business division for the whole college. Mm -hmm. And it pertains to specific business division courses and also specific humanities division courses, especially our new media technology program. So those students get cooperative education um, experience through their uh, CEE courses and they get credits and their experiences are overseen by a faculty advisor. Mm -hmm. So they can get, for example, one to six credits for those experiences. Mm -hmm. And in our office, uh, student development and counseling right now, one of the things we're working on is the statewide municipal internship program. So we actually had a meeting yesterday with our coordinator for Exus County, um, who is the business administrator for Bloomfield. So we were talking about having some different experiences for our students because many of their experiences focus on the police department and criminal justice majors. And we were talking about having something different, like having students come in and do an internship with the engineering department, learn about business, learn about permits, construction, architecture, or doing something with the IT department that would be something different and give our students that exposure that um, people mentioned 
during the presentation today, that need for that exposure. That is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we probably have run over, but we maybe have like one more minute before we close out. First of all, I want to just say thank you to everyone for um, joining the presentation today, but also for just following us on the collaboratives. And we are going to be, you know, we do this every month. I'm, I have the QR code up. If you didn't get an opportunity, this is our QR code to basically take a quick survey and share your thoughts. We're gonna to continue to have these breakouts because what we're doing today, we really absolutely do want to hear from you. And when we talk about that C, this is the C in collaboration and the conversation we will continue outside of our Zoom meetings. So this is a QR code, I hope you got it. We want you to kind of stay up with us, stay tuned. This is a get involved, but you guys are already involved because I've seen many of you here before. So we're gonna invite you back. And you know what the next slide is. You can also follow us. We stay connected. We are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So that would fair, we can fairly say we're across all social media platforms. So don't forget to um, stay connected and join us. And then I just wanna give you a heads up, even though you're going to get this in your email, but these, our next collaborative is next Wednesday, April 27th. That's our infrastructure and energy collaborative. That's going to be same time, same place, Wednesday, the 27th from 10 a.m. to 11. But also as we look forward to May, I know that many of you guys will be busy with um, what's happening on some of your campuses, but we hope that you can join us. We have our manufacturing and supply chain on the 4th, technology and innovation from yours truly on May 11th, and then our health services again on May 18th. And as I, and let's, let me go back. And then after that, on the 25th, we'll have our infrastructure and energy again. So please join us. We're going to continue to provide dynamic conversations like this, as well as presentations on um, our topics going forward. Uh, if you want to be in touch with us, please just connect with us. All of our information uh, is on our website. We are excited. We stay excited, as you can see. Thank you, Frank, Susan, Joanna, Nancy. Uh, oh, I see Catherine uh, Stargell has joined us. Hello. I can say, instead of saying Catherine, uh, I get to say hello, boss. Catherine. <laughs> I, I just want you to thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Vita, put up the uh, QR code for the survey. We want to make sure that our programming is exactly what you all need and want. And this is a way to give us feedback. And we do look at those surveys. Sometimes they sting, um, but we have made changes because of that feedback. So whatever you, know, you can provide for us, we will implement. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Catherine and Helen. And uh, obviously I said, Nancy and Stephanie, thank you for um, joining us today. And with that, I'm gonna say, have a great rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.